We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you are. It looks like we have a fairly forlorn room in Katowice, but I'm glad to see many of you on screen. Um, we're just waiting for one more panelist to join, but I think we should probably get started um, and hope that his link is generated in the meantime. So welcome to this IGF roundtable entitled Protecting Human Rights in the State Business Nexus. Um, this event has been co-organized by the UN OHCHR's BTEC project, by the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, and by Privacy International. My name is Henry Peck, and I'm a human rights and technology researcher at the Resource Center, and I'm one of the two moderators for today's roundtable, along with Isabel Ebert, who's an advisor to UN BTEC. We have about an hour and a half for this conversation, and we're lucky to have several experienced speakers from civil society and the private sector with us. Um, I'll just give a couple of housekeeping notes, which are remember to speak slowly and clearly so that our transcriber can keep up. Um, and we'll have a presentation to begin with, and then we'll switch to um, interventions from our panelists and then have a more free-flowing conversation and time for um, questions and answers at the end. I'll now hand over to Isabel Ebert for a bit more context. Thank you very much, Henry, um, and welcome to the session. Uh, we're sorry that we started a bit late. We're still waiting for uh, one panelist who has actually excellently followed the registering procedure. But you know, it, it, I think it's a, it's a sort of running gag um, to have these sort of tech issues these days. Um, so yes, yeah, thanks also for the Business Human Rights Resource Center for uh, co-organizing this session and also our fellow um, panelists. Um, um, we are. Um, a, a project that is called uh, BTEC and hosted at the Office of the Human Rights uh, uh, Commissioner of the UN. And our focus is on uh, corporate responsibility in the tech sector. And for those of you who are not familiar with the business and human rights uh, terminology, uh, we uh, are focusing our work around the UN guiding principles for business and human rights that have been adopted by the Human Rights Council in 2011 and have become a sort of emerging soft law um, norm in the in the corporate sector have been endorsed by corporates when they were adopted, as well as civil society, international organizations, and individual member states. Um, the guiding principles are um, consisting of three pillars. Um, today's uh, session focuses in particular on pillar one, which is the state duty to protect human rights, and also on a pillar two, which is the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. The third pillar usually focuses on access to remedy and different mechanisms in which um, potential victims of uh, corporate human rights abuses can seek um, a remedy for, for their um, harm. Um, it, the uh, guiding principles as such are not uh, sector specific, and that is exactly why uh, the Big Tech project was launched to break down the um, specific requirements of the guiding principles uh, to the technology sector and articulate what are the specific um, obligations of states and what are the um, responsibilities of uh, technology companies in that area. Um, today's focus um, is on this interlinkage when um, states and uh, technology companies cooperate for various purposes um, that can be for, um, as we will hear later on, really um, public-private partnerships, but there are also other situations where, for example, uh, governments procure um, technology from companies 
that uh, requires additional um, checks and balances. So you, we will explore in today's session a, a, a spectrum of uh, scenarios, how uh, states and technology companies uh, collaborate and which uh, respective obligations and responsibilities uh, should derive from that, um, um, that uh, sort of constellation. Um, just to close, um, you will also uh, probably hear the term uh, human rights due diligence quite uh, frequently in this panel that um, describes a process in which companies should identify, assess and mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are um, stemming from or being linked to their business activities. Um, it is um, also building on an uh, assessment of human rights impacts. So just to, to sort of set the ground, I will put um, in, the, in the chat also the link to our uh, homepage where you can then find more information about the project as such, and I'm happy to answer additional questions. Um, we will have to uh, adapt, I think, the chronology of panelists, as the uh, one panelist, sadly, uh, Dennis Utlo, is still having troubles to connect. Um, I would then pass on to Henry Peck again, for uh, who's, who's uh, volunteering as our kind moderator today um, to, to, to start the session. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Isabel. Um, so to begin with, we're going to hear from Privacy International about their recent work uh, on the state business nexus on one aspect in particular. And then we'll turn to our speakers from the NHRIs of Germany and Chile and from Ericsson and Vodafone for their perspectives and experience. So um, one of the aspects of the state business nexus is of course public procurement and within that the dynamics of public-private partnerships. Privacy International has conducted investigations that have identified a number of issues common to public-private partnerships that involve surveillance technology and the mass processing of data. And they've developed and this week published a set of safeguards in response to these issues and trends, which they're now going to introduce to us. Here to do so is Ilya Siatista, who is Privacy International's Program Director and Acting Legal Director, and Lucy Audibert, who's a Legal Officer at Privacy International. So I'll pass over to you two now and I'll share a copy of the safeguards in the chat as well. Thanks very much, Henry. Um, so uh, it will be mostly me who will be introducing the safeguards. Um, Ilya is here for, for support if needed. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. As always, these things uh, can go wrong. So please let me know. Um, can you see my screen? Great, yes. perfect. You can see just the slide, right? Not the rest, yes. perfect. All right, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, anyone who's in the room in Katowice, I don't know if anyone's there, I can't see any, any faces. Um, and good morning to everyone online for attending. Um, I'm a lawyer at Privacy International, or PI, as some of us call it. Um, we're a, we're a London-based NGO that researches, litigates, and advocates globally against government and corporate abuses of data and technology. Um, so, I'll start with a quick introduction to our work on um, technology and surveillance partnerships and how we came to design our safeguards. And then I'll delve into the safeguards in some but limited detail um, with a few examples. Um, so we at PI have been uh, for some years investigating relationships between states and tech or surveillance companies around the world. Um, in particular, where states contract with companies to develop their surveillance or their data processing infrastructure in order um, always to deliver their public functions or to monitor their populations. Um, what we've observed and what our partners around the world have observed in, in their jurisdictions is that these partnerships don't always resemble um, the a, a sort of traditional one-off commercial relationship that can result from a public tender, for example, um, but are taking on a new form where parties are much more codependent and where states build uh, entire new systems and processes that can be completely reliant on the services of one company while providing companies with access to um, 
a lot of very valuable data that they can then use in developing uh, their own services. So we've analyzed um, a number of examples of such partnerships going wrong around the world. And from these, we've identified a number of common uh, specific issues that stem from this codependence and from the ease which, with which the technologies involved can enable surveillance and sometimes lead to human rights abuses. Uh, and then for each issue, we've designed a corresponding safeguard. So the safeguards are classified between broader principles of transparency, adequate procurement, accountability, legality, necessity, and proportionality, oversight, and redress. Um, these are, as many here will know, um, longstanding principles in international and human rights frameworks um, formulated in different ways. Um, and the safeguards seek to put them into practice in the context of technology or surveillance partnerships. Many of um, our safeguards are actually framed around the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which Isabel has just introduced. Um, and where appropriate, we explain how a particular safeguard furthers the application of a guiding principle. Um, I should say the, the safeguards intend to be jurisdiction blind so that they can apply as widely as, as possible across the globe and can be used uh, for advocacy in various jurisdictions. Um, and one thing to note is that we, we intend on them being a living document that we hope to update regularly with new examples of abuse from across the world and with examples of successful advocacy, which can refine or define new safeguards in the future. So I'll start with the first uh, broad principle that our safeguards fall under, uh, which is the transparency principle, uh, which we see as a preliminary requirement to the challenge of state authority. Um, what we found is that a very common feature of technology partnerships is a lack of transparency that often stems from um, an overprotection of companies' commercial interests and a desire from governments to shield the rationale for their decision making or to shield the extent of their surveillance systems. So an example would be um, in the past few years, the American data analytics company Palantir has developed um, multiple collaborations with the UK government, uh, for example, to build the NHS, uh, the health system vaccination database, or to build the post-Brexit border flow tool. Um, and very few details of these partnerships were initially published, and so we, uh, as civil society, had no idea how pr the, pr the procurement process was conducted. Um, all we had access to were a, a couple of redacted framework agreements that were available on the government's contract website. Um, but these gave no details as to what kind, of, what kind of data would be processed, what Palantir's access to data would be, or what role their software and their algorithms would play in the government's decision making. So after months of pushing um, freedom of information requests around government departments and writing letters to Palantir and the government, we obtained a handful of disclosures of data, data, process, um, sorry, data protection impact assessments or um, data sharing agreements. Again, heavily redacted, often on grounds of volunteers commercial interests and uh, protection of intellectual property rights. So the five transparency safeguards uh, seek to address some of these issues. Um, the very first one is a straightforward one that um, requires that all documentation governing a partnership is made publicly available with legitimate redactions only. Um, the second one, which I'll, I'll focus on a bit more, uh, seeks to address the, the limit on transparency that commercial interests or intellectual property rights impose. Um, and it requires companies to make any technology or software they sell to governments fully auditable at every stage in the partnership, and importantly, prior to contracting. Um, if legitimate legitimate confidentiality concerns exist, um, we think audits can be performed by independent oversight bodies or independent researchers or experts, um, always bound by duties of confidentiality. Um, so hopefully this can address the commercial interests argument that is too often used to shield the logic of public decision making. Um, we think there are many ways available to provide transparency without entirely giving up intellectual property rights um, and this goes through engagement with civil society and oversight bodies, 
uh, and providing sufficient amounts of information to understand the substance of a partnership and, and the technology that it deploys. Um, the next broad principle uh, is the adequate procurement principle, which at, at a basic level requires states to comply with or to put in place, uh, if they don't exist already, formal approval processes uh, for public procurement and to conduct appropriate assessments when deciding to contract with a company. Um, and on the reverse is true as well. Uh, we, we would require companies uh, to, to, to conduct uh, appropriate assessments such as human rights due diligence uh, when they contract with states. So one issue we seek, we seek to address here is one that we've seen in many places around the world and is quite emblematic of technology partnerships where technology is deployed initially for private, commercial or personal purposes are co-opted by public authorities for policing or surveillance purposes without having recourse to required public procurement processes. Um, an example that PI has revealed and criticized uh, last year is the deployment of the company Facewatch in the UK, which is a company that sells cameras equipped with facial recognition to retail shops like supermarkets. Um, and we discovered last year that they offered uh, access to the police to the retail surveillance network that they built across supermarkets, whereby the police could upload pictures of crime suspects to identify them if they visited stores equipped with face watch cameras. And in return, people identified as safety concerns by stores could be denounced to the police through the face watch network. So the issue here for us is uh, an extension of the realm of state surveillance to places where no one had ever intended it to reach. Um, and all of this, of course, without adhering to a public procurement process that would have questioned the very uh, purpose uh, and acceptability and raison d'etre of, of this extension and, and, and these systems. Um, so an example of safeguard we've come up with to address this is um, safeguard 10. Um, requiring that as a principle, public authorities should not have general access to surveillance and mass data processing systems deployed in private spaces, nor any data derived from these systems. So any use of such systems or any access to data should be on an ad hoc basis where the state can request specific information when strictly necessary following the appropriate legal framework and uh, a prescribed procedure for access to these systems or, or this data. Um, our next broad principle is accountability, which um, is a core principle that requires defining responsibilities and identifying obligations, duties, and standards to be imposed on each actor of the partnership. And of course, having documents and policies in place that hold parties to account uh, for these obligations. Um, so an example of issue we've addressed here um, is uh, in France, during the COVID-19 crisis, at the, at the start of the crisis, um, the government attempted to use the existing network of CCTV cameras um, that existed in streets and public transport to turn them into intelligent CCTV cameras to monitor mask wearing and social distancing in public spaces. Um, this was struck down by the French Data Protection Authority, the CNIL, um, because it lacked a legal framework and a clear policy defining the purpose of the monitoring and any red lines. Um, for, so, for example, the CNIL required that uh, it shouldn't be used to identify uh, and prosecute people for not wearing masks, um, and rather that it should only be used for the collection of non-personal data for producing statistics about mask wearing, uh, for example, in order to um, uh, inform the design of incentive policies. Um, so a safeguard that seeks to address that is safeguard 13, um, which uh, requires that whenever a technology is approved for use uh, and for a specific purpose, of course, it should be uh, authorized by law, and we'll come to, to that later, but it should also be accompanied by a technology use policy that defines clear boundaries for the purpose and the use of the technology with an exhaustive list of authorized uses and, an exhaust and a non-exhaustive list of prohibited uses. So any use of the technology that doesn't comply with this policy should undergo a new approval process determining whether the new use would be lawful and compliant with other safeguards. And the technology use policy should be amended to reflect this new agreed use. Um, and of course, any use that is wholly incompatible with um, the original technology deployment's purpose should be rejected. So this is really to address um, 
what well, it's was often called uh, uh, function creep, where it's quite easy for your technologies originally deployed for one specific and acceptable purpose to evolve and regularly expand the realm of surveillance without approval processes um, having been gone through, um, a pro process that are required when you install new technologies. Um, <clears throat> our next uh, broad principle are actually three very fundamental principles, uh, which are legality, necessity, and proportionality. Um, so yeah, fundamental principles in international human rights law. Uh, and in the context of a technology or surveillance partnership, um, this means um, for legality that any use of technology to address a public need or to fulfill, fulfill a public function has to be authorized by an appropriate legal framework. So for example, in the UK, um, the police had been using um, mobile phone extraction technology for uh, a number of years without an appropriate legal framework until the UK data protection regulator uh, um, declared, declared this um, unlawful. And this is only now being rectified in draft legislation. Um, but we went for years uh, with this practice uh, going on without any, any legal framework. Um, for necessity, um, we require that a necessity assessment be con conducted as part of human rights impact assessments to clearly demonstrate that recourse to a particular technology is necessary to achieve defined goals rather than a mere hypothetical uh, potential advantage. Um, and for proportional proportionality, similarly, um, a proportionality assessment has to be conducted to measure the adverse impact on citizens' rights and freedoms and demonstrate that this impact is justified by a corresponding improvement in citizens' welfare, always taking into account any chilling effects on the exercise of fundamental rights. So an example of where these necessity and proportionality assessments um, would have been required um, is uh, in, I think it was two years ago, the municipality of Como in Italy had deployed a facial recognition system provided by the company Huawei. Um, and when civil society obtained the data protection impact assessments that had been for, performed, the deployment of facial recognition um, had only been justified on an isolated incident that had occurred years ago um, and where the municipality couldn't, couldn't explain the need for facial recognition systems rather than more traditional straightforward video surveillance. And the impact assessment didn't contain any any recognition or assessment of the impact on citizens' rights and freedoms of being subjected to facial recognition in this way. So we think these assessments are really essential to demonstrate that states um, have applied proper thought to the real necessity of a particular technology and, and to its impacts. Um, the next uh, principle is the oversight principle. Um, we in, in the safeguards, we require um, continuing oversight rather than these one-off check checkbox exercises to ensure that a technology is constrained to its stated purpose and to detect abuses uh, all along the partnership. So we want independent oversight bodies to be given a clear mandate to monitor a partnership, to undertake regular audits and consultations, and importantly, we want civil society and uh, affected communities fully involved in this oversight. So one of the safeguards we recommend is the institution of a civilian control board, that's safeguard 20. Um, this board would be tasked with monitoring the impact of surveillance technologies on populations uh, so that um, so it should be consulted prior to deployment of any technology. It should seek the opinion and consent of the affected population. And it should be tasked also with receiving and voicing grievances from any affected individuals. Um, so an example of where this would have been necessary is when police forces in the US uh, struck a deal with Amazon Ring to get general access to their doorbell camera security footage. This is uh, something that had a profound impact on the lives of community, communities and neighborhoods, um, creating a sense of distrust uh, and constant surveillance especially on individuals who are at heightened risk of discrimination. So that's why consultation of, of affected communities is absolutely essential. 
And the final uh, principle is redress, uh, which is equivalent to the third pillar uh, of the UNGP's access to remedy. Um, and in, the, in this context, the availability of redress relies on other principles, of course, having, having been upheld, uh, such as seeing through the opacity of an algorithm in order to understand its impact and to seek redress. Um, so the main safeguard we recommend in this section is that policies governing a partnership um, should include re redress provisions that point to existing mechanisms or that establish new mechanisms for handling complaints and enforcing sanctions for violations of policies. Um, so an example of, of where this went wrong is um, in 2017, the Mexican government used uh, NSO's Pegasus hacking software against two lawyers who had been critical of the government who were then assassinated after having, ha having been located thanks to um, uh, the hacking software. Um, so far, NSO has never been held responsible for these atrocities and human rights abuses and has always um, refused to cooperate with efforts to obtain accountability and redress from the Mexican government. Um, so we think that's where redress mechanisms could have required NSO to disclose um, whether they aided the government's surveillance efforts in providing their, their hacking software. Um, just a word of warning uh, that any redress mechanisms should not and never bar access to courts or other uh, established judicial mechanisms, uh, because this can be an, an issue, for example, where if a regulator or an oversight body is designated to handle complaints, um, it might take them years to work through complaints, or they might be purposefully under-resourced by a government, meaning that people aren't able to obtain redress. Um, so in these circumstances, courts should always still be able to accept complaints even if a regulator hasn't yet decided them. And we think this is essential to balance access to justice and uh, quality of justice. Um, so that's it on the safeguards. I hope this has been uh, a useful overview of, of, of what they are and what they seek to address. Um, we're conscious that they're quite high level principles that will need to be refined in practice and that they may not apply in all, in all situations, um, but hopefully they provide a framework for advocacy um, to uphold human rights principles and the, and the UNGPs in the face of privatization of public functions and, and surveillance. Um, so the safeguards are available on our website at privacyinternational.org, and I think Henry has might have shared a link. Um, if you have any questions on the safeguards or any feedback for us, uh, you can reach me by Twitter at the handle over there on the slide. Um, so yeah, I look forward to the broader discussion with panelists. Um, I'm not expecting any specific feedback on the safeguards, I, as I know it's quite a lot to digest. Um, but if you have any, that would be most welcome. Um, and yeah, I'm keen to hear about others' experience in applying the, the guiding principles in the tech sector. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lucy, for these thoughtful and practical findings and guidance. And I think in particular, uh, thinking through the UNGPs, this does provide a really um, useful framing and framework for implementation with concrete settings and circumstances. Um, and it, 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 it is particularly useful also in the, the trend that you're seeing towards more codependent relationships between companies and the state and the need for due and equivalent protections when private actors are providing public services. Um, and similarly, the importance you stressed of regular oversight, not just one-off processes. In the broader uh, session today in our roundtable, I think it's important just to set the safeguards in context, um, given the much wider scope that we're addressing of the state business nexus and um, our panelists today are engaged in a wide range of public-private interactions, not just public-private partnerships, and will speak to different aspects of state business engagement too, including license agreements, which are often more one-dimensional or less codependent than the PPPs that uh, Lucy's described. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first panelist, Dennis Utlu, who's a senior policy advisor at the German Institute for Human Rights, which is Germany's NHRI. Dennis, over to you. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you for 
having me and giving the opportunity um, to intervene in the session. Um, as you said, I'm working for the for a national human rights institution. Currently, I'm also chairing the um, business and human rights working group of the Global Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. So let me start with um, outlining the perspective of NHRIs on our topic. Um, national human rights institutions are neither governmental nor non-governmental organizations. They're entities in between financed by the government, however, independent of it. And they have the mandate to promote and protect human rights. Um, being financed by the government, they're still ought to be independent. And this is checked by a UN level accreditation system. So a status NHRI such as the German Institute for Human Rights for which I'm working may participate at the sessions of the UN Human Rights Council. Um, the, the UNGPs, which were introduced already, mention NHRIs in all three pillars. And, and um, the, the first pillar of the of the NHRI, uh, of the sorry, of the NGPs do summarize somehow um, states' obligations. And these are just to be clear, um, these are obligations. This is not um, these are not guidelines. These are, it summarizes international law and human rights law, which is um, binding for governments, different than the second pillar, which is uh, the, the um, um, pillar on the, for the co corporate respect on uh, human rights. So the commentary uh, uh, to guiding principles three states that NHRIs, national human rights institutions should help states to identify whether relevant laws are aligned with their human rights obligations, and if they are effectively enforced. This means that NHRIs can serve as an intermediary between different state agencies to check with them, first, if they sufficiently follow a human rights-based approach, including in establishing PPPs or in public procurement procedures, and second, to monitor if they align with states' human rights obligations when using data technology or interfering with tech companies, including long-term strategic relations with them. Um, third, NHRIs can also, if they have the capacity, undertake human rights impact assessments and artificial intelligence impact assessments. Human rights risks and um, or impact assessments are a necessary governmental task before a procurement decision is taken or a collaboration with a private actor is established. Collaboration between state agencies and tech companies is already an area of human rights concerns, for instance, in state missions such as building critical digital infrastructure, the use of uh, surveillance technologies to advance public safety, applications for the criminal justice system or border controls, national defense and national security. That um, human rights impact assessments or impact assessments are necessary follows from the requirement of adequate oversight as stated in um, guiding principle five in the first pillar of the UNGPs in the section on the state business nexus of, uh, of the UNGPs. Um, it states, quote, uh, states should exercise adequate oversight in, order, oversight in order to meet their international human rights obligations when they contract with or legislate for business enterprises to provide services that may impact upon the enjoyment of human rights. And then the commentary to Guiding Principle 5 um, concretized this. States should ensure that they can effectively oversee their enterprise's activities including through the provision of adequate independent monitoring and accountability mechanisms. In fact, the, the privacy international safeguards do reflect those requirements in Safeguard 7 and 8. Safeguard 7 uh, states, DPIAs should be performed for the deployment of any technology involving the processing of personal data, whether the processing is considered to be likely to result in an a high risk to individuals or not, where algorithms will be used to make automated decisions, AIAs ought to be performed as well. So these obligations are reflected in the safeguards and uh, made more concrete here 
which is helpful, as I find. Um, governments should involve independent experts as well for doing those impact assessments or for um, uh, executing those impact assessments. And NHRIs can clearly contribute here. For instance, to give you a, a good practice example, has the Australian Human Rights Commission been undertaking a human rights and technology project led by Human Rights Commissioner Ed Santo? They produced a discussion paper in two, back in 2019, which recommended the establishment of an AI safety commissioner as an independent statutory officer within the NHRI. Independently, the Australian government already has an e-safety commissioner who can cooperate with the NHRI when ne where necessary. And the, the e-safety commissioner is a cross-sectional governmental agency that monitors the human rights impacts of the government's use of artificial intelligence. Such a body within the government and in other entities such as NHRIs should systematically be involved in public procurement procedures and in the establishment of any uh, strategic um, relationship with private uh, actors. Um, this said, it should be clear that the field of human rights impacts by technology companies is still a fairly new area for the human rights community. Therefore, governments should allocate resources for generating knowledge here and expertise, for instance, within NHRIs, but not only, and um, for other independent human rights expert groups, especially in the area of data economy and artificial intelligence, where the technical expertise usually lays outside of governmental and human rights bodies. Collective action can also be a way to safeguard human rights due diligence in some public, public procurement procedures. In general, meaningful involvement of civil society organizations and affected groups um, is needed to reinforce accountability for states to prioritize human rights protection in whatever action they undertake, including uh, public-private partnerships and public procurement. Um, UNGP 6 sets out that, again, the first pillar sets out that, uh, quote, states should promote respect for human rights by business enterprises with which they conduct commercial transactions, quote, end of quote. So the UNGPs envision an implementation of the state's duty to protect here by using public procurement as a tool to move business enterprises towards a stronger application of human rights due diligence and it is, it is described in pillar two of the UNGPs. So uh, you know that there's the human rights due diligence cycle, um, right, uh, having a risk assessment, taking uh, measures to address them, and um, um, checking if, if, if uh, the measures were effective, and then um, delivering a remedy and reporting on that. So this is basically, um, in a nutshell, the human rights due diligence circle, which is described in detail in the in pillar two of the UNGPs and in pillar one, where the state obligations are um, described, it says actually public procurement should be used. Uh, well, it's a, it is an interpretation to be fair, but I, I, I just read out the quote um, where, where you see the source for this interpretation. Um, for now, however, procurement law often regards human rights as a secondary restriction, not equally important as financial aspects of the procurement decision. The German procurement law, for instance, allows public officers to take aspects of sustainability and human rights into account, but neither is this obligatory, nor is there any mechanism that incentivizes public procurement towards a decision-making in favor of human rights. Approaches like this may, may even incentivize public agents to find a way around human rights when they are cooperating with the private sector, since the primary goal and mission is something else, namely rather reducing costs than respecting human rights. But respect and protection of human rights is a cross-disciplinary state obligation that should be the basis of any government, of really any governmental undertaking. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, that was really a useful overview of both NHRI responsibilities, but also the overlap with the different guiding principles and the different legally binding requirements and responsibilities. Um, I'm going to turn over now to Theo Yekel, who's the corporate responsibility expert at Ericsson. Thank you, Henry. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. 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 <clears throat> Good. Uh, hope, please let me know if there are any, I've had some issues with Zoom lately, so please let me know if you can't hear me but anyway thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today and thank you for the very interesting uh, introductory presentation as well from uh, privacy international um, maybe just to start to explain uh, kind of the position of ericsson within the uh, um, ict ecosystem when we're talking about these issues um, so Ericsson, we're a um, communication network provider so we provide the infrastructure and we do this through our customers who are usually communication service providers or mobile operators. So we rarely deal directly with government entities, but do so of course, as they are the end users of some of our technology through business partners and our customers, such as the mobile operators, for example. Um, and many of the questions that have been raised here uh, today, even though we don't deal with them through private uh, public private public or private partnerships uh, as i said i mean our end users are sometimes government entities so many of the issues of uh, conducting human rights impact assessments and due diligence in our uh, business engagements with our customers are of course something that is crucial from from our perspective as well um, and maybe just to to reflect on some of the points that were, were raised before, um, I think when, when talking about these issues of, of how to protect human rights and dealing with surveillance technologies, uh, one issue going back to the point of transparency, uh, which is I think very important, is to clarify the roles of the different actors in the ICT ecosystem to understand what responsibilities they have and what is reasonably expected from a UN guiding principles perspective of the different actors in order to make sure that each player in these in this ecosystem both companies and states uh, take their responsibility seriously uh, because i think if we um, only uh, apply the same kind of uh, expectations or the same uh, practical requirements on all types of, of actors and players in this ecosystem that might not be really relevant or adaptable to what's uh, what's feasible for each actor. Um, so we recently uh, published a report on, on 5G and human rights, for example, where we explore this concept of different players in the ecosystem, both from a vendor perspective, mobile operators, if it's uh, platforms, government entities, uh, and making sure that we also raise awareness about these issues across across the value chain, across this ecosystem. Um, so that's my, my first point on, on transparency. I think that it's we need to think about these issues also beyond single transactions, but what role can we as companies play in dialogue with both government entities, our business partners, but also civil society in raising awareness about how the technology is used, what is the purpose of the technology, what is the risk of misuse, and how we can mitigate it as different uh, players in this ecosystem. Um, to the point also of, of the state business nexus, which is very, uh, of course, uh, uh, important from a UN guiding principles perspective as well, I think it's crucial for us not to um, forget that one of the um, kind of important uh, contributions of the UN guiding principles when they were adopted uh, 10 years ago is defining that distinction between the state duty to protect and the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. So of course the corporate responsibility to respect exists regardless of a state's ability or willingness to uh, comply with their duty to, to protect human rights. So we need to take our responsibility regardless. Uh, and of course part of the state duty is potentially regulating corporate behavior. 
but I think we should be cautious in not blurring those lines too much uh, when we're talking about um, dealing with these types of issues in, from, a, from a human rights perspective, uh, where, for example, state duties would be applied to companies. Um, so I'm not saying that companies, as I said, I mean, our responsibility uh, exists regardless of a state's ability, but I think we still need to have that distinction and that's really what the UN Guiding Principles, one of the strongest contributions of the UN Guiding Principles and why, why, it's, uh, why we apply those, that thinking in our uh, way of working is because it is that clear distinction, which I think is, is, is an important um, part of how we design our due diligence frameworks and what we can do in practice. And then maybe just the last point before I, I hand over back to you, Henry, is, is on, on, on remedy and, and redress. And I think that's an also an, a point that uh, has been discussed to, to, to quite some extent in, within our industry, not, not the least within the BTEC project, is, is how to design and enable remedy, again, in this ecosystem approach. Uh, because in some cases, uh, certain companies such as Ericsson might sometimes be a few steps removed from, from the actual potentially impacted stakeholders. Uh, so, I mean, kind of applying the thinking of operational level grievance mechanisms in our industry might be quite difficult or not really effective. Uh, but what can we learn from other industries, such as the financial sector, for example, in designing and enabling a remedy in an ecosystem approach? Again, maybe not just specifically for a specific transaction, uh, but partnering with our business partners, customers, uh, uh, civil society organizations uh, in, in raising transparency again, but kind of building in those uh, systems. Uh, and also thinking about what is rights respecting remedy uh, for privacy violations, for example. Um, that needs maybe a specific approach as well. So I think that is something that we really need to focus more on in, in our industry. And, and of course, in collaborations with, with governments as well. Uh, so I think I'll stop there for, for now and hand back to you, Henry, thanks. Thank you, Teo. Thank you for um, spelling out also a bit more about the differences in in, in actors um, among communication network providers as well as vendors and other elements within this ecosystem um, and the challenges of applying some of these principles wholesale given uh, the distinctions you've you've shared. I'm now going to turn over to Moira Oliver who is the human rights lead for Vodafone. Um, so Moira, over to you if you're ready. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, and good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Um, I think it was really helpful actually to follow on from Teo because um, it, it's, uh, as you're saying, Henry, it's really important to understand different relationships, I think, within the ecosystem. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about Vodafone and how we operate and then come on to also talk about our interactions um, with government through the licensing arrangements, which you mentioned, Henry, at, at, at the top of the, um, the call. Um, and again, just to, to um, make it clear that we don't, as Vodafone, operate um, public-private partnerships in the way that um, Lucy has described, although really excellent paper and, and great insights and I think you know the theme of that about transparency is one that I'd, I'd also want to pick up in in a moment so Vodafone um, is the largest fixed and mobile operator in Europe and we also operate in in other countries um, we have mobile and fixed networks in 21 countries and then we partner with um, others commercially in about 40 49 more. And overall, just to give you a sense of the scale, we have 300 million um, mobile customers. So um, obviously we, we uh, operate at scale, as you see, but um, what, we, uh, what we do is basically give people connections. We don't um, operate platforms for people to um, provide you know, online content. Um, and we, we contract with individuals and businesses um, uh, around, around the world to provide them with that connectivity. As part of that, um, so when we operate in different countries, when we have actual licenses to operate for our subsidiaries, then we are um, required, to, as, as you said, to have a, a license um, from 
from the government um, of that country. Um, I think it whilst it is a contractual arrangement, so there'll be contractual obligations as part of it, um, it's not a contract in the sense it's something that you can really negotiate. So often um, it's very much standard terms. And as part of um, those licensing requirements, we have to comply with local laws. Um, and I think this is um, you know, where we see the sort of interesting nexus between um, state obligations under pillar one and, and companies' obligation under, under pillar two. And I, I completely agree with Teo about the importance of, of, of understanding the separation of responsibilities. Um, I think you know, often the challenge can be in, if you are operating in a country or um, indeed, you know, we haven't talked about suppliers, but sourcing from a country where um, the rule of law or respect for human rights um, or the state obligation that Dennis was talking about is, is not um, uh, in place to, to the international standard. And I think that, you know, presents some, some real challenges because as they were saying, you know, that as a, as a company, you still have your obligation to respect human rights. But if you are operating in, in a, um, a framework where there isn't that, there's sort of statutory safeguard, and that can be a real challenge. And I guess, you know, where um, this particularly comes into play is in the area um, of uh, law enforcement demands, for example, if um, as an operator, you may be required to um, comply with a local direction to um, either um, pass certain customer data to, to the local government or to block um, the network uh, in, in certain, you know, or, or throttle the network in, in some respect. And I think that, you know, that can be a real challenge. And, um, you know, Vodafone joined the Global Network Initiative. Um, there's also in, in the GNI and a number of other operators to really uh, highlight, you know, the challenges that, that there can be in this, in this um, area in, around the world. And I think, you know, going back to this point about transparency that Lucy was saying, um, you know, I think it is a key part of um, the UN guiding principles. I think this is you know, a really uh, critical and important way of, of shining light on, on, on some of those challenges. Um, Vodafone has been issuing transparency reports since 2014, which talk about some of those challenges and, and give data where we can. I think going to, you know, Theo's point about remedy, um, and be very interested to hear others' thoughts on this, but, you know, when, um, when people's uh, data is under, um, you know, has, is part of a, a law enforcement demand, for example, um, often people won't even know because there is no obligation um, in some jurisdictions. In fact, in some jurisdictions, it's um, you know, against the law to actually disclose this. Some countries allow for disclosure after the event, but you know, it, it, it's very difficult, I think, to talk about remedy if um, you don't know that your, the, your rights have been impacted. Um, so I think that's a particular conundrum. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just pause there. I think um, in the chat, uh, there's a link to, to our materials and um, our law enforcement uh, demand reporting is, is available from that link as well. Thank you. Thank you, Moira, thanks so much. Um, I think I'll move straight on to our final panelist. Sebastian Smart, who is a senior advisor at the National Human Rights Institution of Chile. And then we'll turn over to questions from the audience and can have a more free-flowing discussion. Sebastian, over to you. Many thanks, Henry. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, for the invitation to be part of this panel and special thanks to the Business and Human Rights Resource Center the BTEC project and Privacy International as well for organizing this conversation and to all the panelists as well from whom I already learned uh, a lot now. Um, 
There are a few questions that guide our conversation. And, and, and the first question uh, that talks about the value of the UNGPs and our experience uh, in practice working with the UNGPs, I'll have to start by saying that uh, I have worked with the UNGPs from different also perspectives. Uh, first, from an academic point of view, uh, then applying it to extractive industries in Chile particularly, and then working with different companies and civil society organizations on issues related to technology uh, and human rights, and currently working in the Chilean National Human Rights Institution. And I think that such personal progression has to do also with uh, the progressive interest of different sectors, I will say, in the UNGPs as well. Um, so we have to remember that when the UNGPs were Firstly, being drafted, the main sectors that grab uh, the attention were companies that operate through extended supply chains and, and extractive companies. And tech companies at this point of view that were usually considered only, I will say, narrowly in the context of censorship and surveillance. Uh, and, and in fact, if you remember that period, uh, and due especially to the Occupy movement and the Arab Spring, tech companies and platforms uh, that they provided, of course, were seen as enablers of democratic activism. And so tech companies were mostly seen as enablers of human rights rather than threats to, to them. Right? But um, that narrative, I will say that did not only affect the drafting of the UNGPs, uh, but created as well an environment where governments, regulations were seen, I will say, as negative and counterproductive. Yeah. <clears throat> in recent years, I will say, however, we have seen how companies and how governmental activities have uh, generated an increasingly adverse impact on, on human rights from issues that have been clearly well expressed here, from issues of freedom of expression, surveillance, and, and decision-making, I will say, for social programs that lack the transparency and may end up uh, discriminating, which is uh, of particular importance in the context of increasing privatization of public responsibilities. I think that then the smart tools uh, or mix of tools given by the UNGPs, including regulation, public procurement, national, national action plans on pillar one, but also the set of tools provided in Pillar 2 for companies can be uh, a starting point uh, to avoid such consequences. Uh, in other words, UNGPs should be like the basic model, if you want to put it the floor, where we should start building a coherent mechanism to protect and promote human rights uh, in, in the digital environment. And, and, and in that context, I will say that PI safe words for public-private partnership in tech are an excellent complement, uh, or if you want to put it, a clear guidance on how to develop the UNGPs in a specific context when it comes to tech. I still think that one of the biggest challenges that we have at this point of growing interest of applying the UNGPs and different guidances to specific national or even transnational context is policy coherence. And let me give you a couple of examples of uh, in Chile no, of this smart mix, I will say smart mix of regulatory frameworks uh, that are currently using the UNGPs and that keep us, uh, at least in the Chilean National Human Rights Institution, especially alert. Uh, on the one hand, we are in the midst of developing a second national action plan on business and human rights. And it should be remembered that the first national action plan on business and human rights does not refer to technology uh, at all. No? So we expect that the second uh, national action plan will have some issues that relate to tech and business and human rights, um, especially because, because it counts with better stakeholders consultation mechanisms. Also, there are a series of bills and regulatory frameworks of special uh, importance to the digital environment that are currently being discussed in Congress uh, and that have been criticized for different reasons. Uh, among them, the recent strategy uh, on artificial intelligence, for example, which makes 
few or almost none references to, to human rights or to business and human rights rights. Also the existence of a bill that creates a data regulation regulator, but which lacks the um, sufficient independence from the executive branch uh, and a bill to regulate digital platforms that has been strongly criticized by the Global Network Initiative. And the biggest criticism here has been that in the way that it's formulated, the law could excessively limit freedom of expression. Finally, and I think more importantly, Chile is going through a process of profound change uh, or constitutional reform, which means a, a potential change in the institutions for the promotion and protection of human rights, but also in the human rights catalog. And here I'll say particularly important, the social rights catalog. Uh, and despite uh, these issues, uh, the question of the relationship between social rights and a digital welfare state, uh, as Philip Alston puts it, uh, where we see an increasing privatisa privatization of decision-making processes uh, seems to be uh, absent in the current constitutional process in Chile. And, and, and here is where I'd like to put some, some attention, no? particularly because um, this situation in the Latin American context can be, I will say, catastrophic, not just for human rights, but also for democratic stability in, in Latin American countries. And, and in this specific context, PI safe was for public-private partnerships in tech, give us some, I will say, guidance to avoid uh, part of those problems. No? Firstly, I will say that it's particularly worrying from a private-public partnership perspective when it comes to social rights, uh, are the um, systems of surveillance, inspection, and, and punishment of people who do, do not meet the criteria for uh, access to social rights no? um, and processes that have increasingly relied on the use of digital technologies and automated decision making processes. A second issue uh, to take into account is the assurance or guarantee of equal and effective access to enjoyment of social rights so that digital or artificial intelligence technologies used in the provision of, of social services do not imply uh, obstacles that affect the holders of, of these rights. And a third issue is to ensure that decisions about people's uh, welfare do not depend exclusively or decisively on automated decision-making systems, whether or not they are based on artificial intelligence techniques. So wrapping up, I'll uh, say that we are experiencing a growing context where states engage in privatization or contracting out of tech services that may impact on human rights, um, that in these processes, governments must exercise adequate oversight. And here I'm using the words from the UNGP system, uh, including by ensuring that contracts or enabling legislation communicate with states, expect, the state's expectation that service providers will respect human rights for service, of service users. Uh, and yet that's not uh, enough, no? As PISF was clearly put it, uh, states should promote awareness of and respect for human rights by businesses, including through the terms of procurement contracts. In such a complex scenario, my biggest worry, I will say, is how to ensure policy coherence, uh, including when the state acts as an economic actor. How do we ensure uh, that government expect expectations, for example, towards technology companies may not cause confusion uh, among companies and stakeholders as well? For example, how do we give tools to governments through, uh, for example, through public procurement to distinguish between companies that have or do not have robust human rights policies and due diligence processes. And on the other side, how do we uh, ensure that companies do not ignore, as we have already said here, regulatory requirements or guidances uh, of different states. And in my opinion here, and here I, I finish, national human rights are key actors for achieving 
such policy coherence in public procurement and any policy that makes the relation between governments and tech companies. And there are good examples on how that can be achieved in the digital sector. Dennis has already given good examples uh, in Germany. Also the Danish Institute for Human Rights joined, for example, Global Partners Digital to create a guide for including tech issues in national action plans. I had a great uh, opportunity to participate in the initial steps of that guide. And in Chile, we, from our side, we have published extensively on business and human rights, and we are starting, I'll say, and, and here I said starting a process in, in the tech sector. So happy to partner with different organizations or to take good practices to, to continue that work. So many things. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you for that very useful um, intervention and introduction to some of the work you're encountering in Chile and the circumstances you're encountering and broader developments among NHRIs. Um, that is the end of our set presentation and panelist intervention stage. And so we're going to turn over to question and answers. And while we're collecting these, I might kick off just by returning to Lucy and Ilya and um, ask a little bit about what are your next steps for the safeguards? And perhaps if you could also um, speak about ideas for engaging actors with them and also how to deal with a, uh, a, a sort of pandemic climate in which um, PPPs are increasingly, well, are, may, may be rushed through under the guise of emergency and how to, how to effectively navigate um, such circumstances or emergency needs with the safeguards that you've proposed. Yes, for sure. Thanks, Henry. And thanks, everyone, for, for the really interesting um, sharing of experiences um, and, the, and the positive comments on, on the safeguards as well. Um, so in terms of next steps for the safeguards, um, so we've just published them uh, today for the first time, um, but we've started uh, using them in various aspects of our work. Um, and because our work often revolves around um, understanding the role of companies and states often at the same time uh, in enabling surveillance. Um, we have found them already quite useful in advocating for stronger protection. So for example, in the context of um, platform workers' rights, uh, uh, we found some of them quite useful to, 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 recommend, um, to recommend protections against uh, sharing of data between um, um, sharing of, of employees data uh, from platforms to, to governments and things like that. Um, otherwise, uh, we have partners, uh, partner CSOs around the world who have started to use them in, in their own advocacy. Um, and this advocacy can be um, uh, within specific uh, partnerships. Um, so when when uh, partners investigate a partnership and, and advocate for um, protections, um, they, they can be useful there, but they can also be useful, and, we're, and that's where we're hoping to do a bit more next year, um, when um, uh, doing advocacy, legislative advocacy. Um, so uh, in the context of the European Union AI Act, for example, we're, we're hoping that um, some of the protections that we recommend uh, can, can make their way into in there because what, we, we find that there's a lack of consideration uh, in the AI Act to the, 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 these relationships between, between states and companies that can enable um, uh, abuses of AI. Uh, and so if we, if, we, if, we, if we want to have protections that work, then we think this, this, this relationship should be uh, tackled head on. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, so I think yeah, that's what that's what our aim is is to is to really um, encourage a civil society to to use them when uh, denouncing specific partnerships, but also um, in in legal advocacy. Um, and then your other question was um, about the pandemic and um, how to uh, how to face partnerships um, when they're rushed through. Um, well, we, we we think actually that that's where 
that's really where the safeguards can be most useful because if you <clears throat> if you have a set of um, established protections, maybe in legislation or in policies, uh, in, in companies' policies or in governments' policies uh, that have been um, a, a agreed upon um, and passed through in advance, when you're faced with these rushed these rushed circumstances, um, this is that that's when it, they become really useful because you can. Um, you don't have to scramble to think about uh, what kind of process you need to go through, uh, about what kinds of assessments you need to make. Um, you've got this this checklist that you can you can go through and ensure that you're not, um, you know, pouring in um, massive amounts of money as we've seen in the pandemic uh, in, into solutions that will end up being uh, counterproductive or that will end up harming uh, harming individuals and, and communities. Um, so so yes, the, so. That, that's really when we, we would love to, to the, for them to be used as a checklist uh, for these kind of um, uh, rush situations. Um, and we, we've actually seen the, the most problematic partnerships in the past couple of years have often arisen from, from the pandemic and from these, uh, these, um, these uh, yeah, rush situations. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. No, that, that's definitely more food for thought. Um, I'm going to pass to Isabel, who may say a few words about how BTEC has approached these different challenges within the state um, business nexus umbrella. Yeah, thanks, Henry. And uh, I think also we, we had really uh, fantastic interventions from our panelists um, that describe um, the challenges on the ground. Um, Obviously, so uh, three points on 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 and reflections on discussions. So you will see that um, we we put out one uh, foundational paper as part of um, the uh, BTEC project, um, which has a focus on pillar one, and in particular, and I just put the link in the chat. And in particular, headline four um, articulates some of the um, actions that the state can take to uphold their um, state duty to protect. Um, and uh, some of the examples we are mentioning is really that um, when states, for example, um, work with um, export credit uh, agencies, support uh, export credit agencies, finance them, they have a really strong leverage to incentivize companies to demonstrate that they're carrying out proper human rights due diligence, that they're reviewing um, relationships with, with state agencies properly. Um, and we, we have, we've included a few of those examples. Um, another area is obviously also development finance. Um, the, for example, the European Investment Bank is going to publish a report um, probably this week on, on the responsibilities of telecommunication companies uh, towards human rights, but obviously also that entails the responsibility of development finance institutions to also review um, in which type of, of companies they're investing and to differentiate between those companies that are really leaders in the human rights space and are becoming more accountable and transparent are putting a lot of effort into their processes and uh, on the other hand the ones that are really uh, the laggards and, and are failing to demonstrate um, the, these, these um, crucial activities on, on uh, respecting human rights. Um, the, the second uh, point I wanted to make is that obviously um, that's why we are also here today. Um, we are we're happy to uh, as BTEC to act as a platform for exchange to also convene stakeholders if they want to uh, work together on sort of operationalizing uh, what uh, good practices could look like for state business nexus relationships. Um, and um, that also entails that we're currently um, in parallel convening conversations about how a um, rights respecting approach to technology regulation should look like. So what, what you can sort of, where, where the, um, where sort of the uh, cutoff points where a, a, a regulation might get too broad and over regulatory and, and what would be um, elements of a regulation that is really, um, um, focusing on, on impact um, rather than um, um, yeah, compliance. Um, and the third point I wanted to make is um, obviously uh, we are not operating in a vacuum. Um, um, BTEC is convening a company um, community of practice where we um, work with um, the um, respective representatives in the um, technology companies to talk through some of these challenging situations. 
um, which also sometimes include um, challenging situations um, when states are the uh, business counterpart. Um, I will also, uh, after I spoke, uh, put some links um, in the chat regarding that, where you can see some reflections out, coming out of these conversations. Um, so really, um, uh, just to summarize, on one hand, we've put out uh, language what um, what the UNGPs uh, can say about uh, state business nexus relationships. We're happy to uh, provide a platform, and we are also really happy to to listen to all types of stakeholders about uh, about their work. Not, of course, only business, but also civil societies and NHIs, where we will be intensifying the work with. Um, and yeah, um, you can obviously always reach out to us. I will also put our email address in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, I want to open it up for anyone to respond if they'd like, and please just raise your hand uh, on the platform. I think we've lost Theo, unfortunately, um, due to a connection issue, but we'll try to get him back in. Um, but yeah, please feel free to, to um, flag if you'd like to, to add to anything that's been said. And in the meantime, Moira, if you're willing to talk a little bit about um, something you mentioned in terms of uh, Vodafone joining the GNI and maybe the effect that's had on your practices, but also perhaps talking about operating in a, in a playing field that's not entirely level, where some companies are giving more attention to these issues than others, and how that um, may be a challenge that you encounter um, in dealing with different contexts. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, maybe Isabel could put a link in the chat to the GNI's website for, for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, GNI is a multi-stakeholder organization with investors, um, large platform companies and, and telcos as well, um, uh, academics, um, NGOs and others. And I think it was very much, um, you know, set up to address the issue of advocating for privacy and free expression globally, particularly in the context of, of um, that sort of state business nexus that we've been talking about in terms of law enforcement demands. Um, I think, you know, how does it help? Well, I think GNI is a great organization. It has a set of um, GNI principles that all um, company members must adhere to. It has an assessment framework that goes with that. And so I think where it, it particularly has helped bridge um, the gap, maybe the, the gap that I think the BTEC project has also been addressing, which, um, you know, it's been, it's been great working in the BTEC over the past year. But this, I think, you know, we have had this challenge of, you know, the UNGP is a great foundational document, but what does it mean in practice? You know, what does it mean to implement the UNGP throughout an organization? What does it mean in particular scenarios? And I think, you know, the tech sector has set some particularly interesting, you know, AI has been mentioned a few times. So I think, you know, this is a, exactly the sort of area where um, tech is moving ahead and regulation is maybe struggling to catch up. And so I think this is where organizations like the GNI or, or BTEC have really helped to sort of work through what it means um, uh, in terms of the UNGPs and respecting human rights in certain specific scenarios. So I think that that has been really helpful for Vodafone and a number of other companies just to really understand, you know, the policies and processes that you need to, to have in place, um, uh, as well as the shared learning and, of course, the outreach. And on, on GNI's website, there's, um, for example, uh, the um, country legal frameworks um, resource, which gives a summary of um, uh, the laws that relate to the issues that GNI deals with around, around the world. So you know, that sort of transparency is also part, part of its advocacy. Um, so uh, I've forgotten your second question now, but um, certainly, um, yeah, it, it's helpful in terms of um, that, that sort of policy and implementation piece. Do you want to remind me of your second yes. question, Henry? Sure. No, thank you. And that, I mean, that sort of leads into it, which is really um, operating in a field where not all of your competitors are members of the GNI or adhering to the yeah. same principles. Got it. How, yeah. do, how do you anticipate 
throttling situations, for example, and how does that um, affect the corporate behavior? I think, you know, when it comes to those specific demands there, um, you know, we have to be honest, there's very little that we, you can do because you have to comply with the law. It's, it's around how do you, um, how do you evaluate the law? So I guess, you know, when, when it comes to the UNGPs and GNI principles, um, it's around the policies and processes that you have in place to evaluate whether, you know, the, the legal position, whether the legal position is, applies, is, you know, is the demand in writing, et cetera. Um, whereas maybe some other companies that operate um, uh, without such adherence might, might interpret the demand differently. I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you're a licensed operator, then the, the, the the obligations apply to everyone it's I think as I said it's about how you go about um, implementing it or, or you know making a decision about implementation I think um, I, I think this point around loving level playing field is a really important one Henry because I think you know a number of companies have been um, very advanced in implementing the UNGPs throughout their business operations for, for a number of years and and making you know, good progress and good good efforts. Um, you know, and other companies ha haven't uh, seen the need to do that. And um, I think you know, with the proposed EU mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, obviously we have yet to see the, the exact detail. But I think you know, it's exactly that kind of framework which is needed to sort of create um, a level playing field. For, for, and, and also, you know, to make sure that all companies um, live up to their responsibilities in this respect. Thank you, Moira. Thanks a lot. Um, I might call on Sebastian, if I may, if you're up for it, in terms of, well, you spoke a little bit about um, your initial responses to the safeguards, and perhaps you could also talk about if there are any challenges or gaps you foresee, or in terms of maybe more locally to Chile, whether you think the developments in um, mandatory human rights due diligence in the EU will help or affect or, or have any impact within Chile. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Uh, well, I think that in, in terms of, I would say, more challenges uh, of the safeguards in, in, in Chile, as I was saying before, I think that one of the, uh, and I, I, it's not about the, the safeguards, it's, it's about uh, Chile itself. No? It's how to start thinking about a, a digital welfare state uh, that we may have. We are starting having it now, but we may have uh, uh, clearly in the future, and how um, social rights specifically uh, in Latin American contexts uh, are key issues, uh, and are key issues that may end up uh, uh, breaking uh, democracies, uh, I mean, fragile democracies as we have in, in, in some countries in Latin America. Uh, and, and that we, we have just uh, seen that uh, by the end of 2019 with massive mobilizations in Chile. And my biggest worry uh, nowadays is, well, uh, how are we going to um, think about uh, issues that are not currently uh, in the agenda uh, in Latin American context, in Chile particularly, uh, and how we start thinking about uh, these issues now? How, how do we start uh, thinking about uh, companies who are taking uh, uh, the place of uh, governments in some in some issues, specifically in in deciding, for example, social programs uh, that are developed in, in in national context, and what are the responsibilities for those companies? First, on the first hand, and secondly, what will be the responsibilities of governments? Uh, in dealing or having these partnerships with uh, with private companies, and here there are specific programs, very well described in in the safeguards in different contexts, uh, but in Chile as well. Now we have uh, 
health programs which are led by private companies uh, uh, decisions on um, for example children social programs that are decided through algorithm uh, uh, that we really don't know what is happening there no we we cannot open that black box so issues of transparency when we have uh, automated decision making are uh, specifically difficult and my biggest worry is that it's not part of, of the agenda and I'm sure that that will be uh, a problem in the near future specific especially when uh, massive mobilizations in the Latin American context come from uh, the inequalities made by social programs in, in, in our country. So uh, how these uh, issues uh, are going to leverage the uh, importance of social policies and how it's not yet, uh, not just in the Latin American agenda, but mostly in in the digital environment, when we talk, we mostly talk about privacy and freedom of expression, but we don't talk much about, for example, uh, social uh, issues or social rights. And, and I think that that's uh, an issue. Uh, and, and I think that that's a, a huge gap uh, in the digital environment itself. Uh, and from the UNGPs, I think that we have to start thinking about those issues. Thanks. And just to hold you for a second, there's a question from the audience, which uh, links well to that, which is the underlying issue in the problematic areas, AI, privacy, freedom of expression, and to continue your chain, the more social rights, is the use and abuse of personal data. Do we have or do we need principles and action to clarify and take action on matters of personal and impersonal data? And we've just got a couple of minutes left, so just to let you know. Well, definitely. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, it's an issue. It's an issue. Also, uh, we are a couple of. Uh, uh, we, we still have to do some progress progress in order to have uh, good uh, regulation in terms of the usage of personal data. For example, we, in Chile and in most in different Latin American countries as well, we we don't have. Uh, data protection authorities yet uh, and and that's how we have to start thinking or looking at good experiences but also uh, at looking at what has gone wrong in other countries in order to not just to replicate it in the national context but to adapt it to to, to the national context and, and how that usage of personal data of course may end up uh, generating uh, uh, human rights abuses, and, and, and when we talk about human rights abuses in the Latin American context, we, we, we talk about gross human rights abuses. I mean, when you use personal data, you 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 end up as uh, as the Mexican example uh, given by Lucy before. I mean, you may end up uh, uh, making extrajudicial executions in in the Latin American country. So that's that's the issue that we are dealing with here. Thank you, thanks very much. We've just got a minute or two left, so if there are any final responses or interventions, otherwise I don't think we really have time for a new question thread, but um, yeah, so speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, <laughs> I'm being told we need to close. Thank you, Lucy, Moira, Sebastian, Theo, and Dennis, our uh, terrific speakers today um, and thank you for the discussion. Thank you Isabel and BTEC for co-hosting and to the IGF and the few attendees who did make manage to make it to our room in person. Um, really glad to have had this conversation and looking forward to continuing it in due course. Thanks very much. Thank you Henry, thanks everyone. Bye.